Tonight, breaking news from Pfizer as the country faces another COVID-19 surge. The company saying that their booster shot appears to provide strong protection against the Omicron variant. Six states now making up half the country's hospitalizations and most of the patients are unvaccinated. More than 1,000 Americans still dying from the virus every day. And the new poll out, a majority of the country saying they are not canceling their holiday plans. Also tonight, Epstein's secret photos from foot massages on private private planes to traveling the globe. The photo seized from Jeffrey Epstein's mansion, revealing Ghislaine Maxwell's intimate love affair with the convicted sex offender. Prosecutors racing through this case. Could the trial wrap up before the new year? Tragedy at Niagara Falls, the shocking video of a car submerged in water and just feet from the fall's edge. A first responder then battling wind, snow and freezing water to try and save the driver inside. Deadly mistake. The trial begins for the former Minnesota police officer caught on camera fatally shooting Dante Wright during a traffic stop. She says she mistook her gun for a taser. Wright's mother breaking down on the stand today. The prosecution ripping the officer's defense saying she betrayed her badge. Cancun jet ski attack. Gunmen in the water opening fire at a beach in Cancun. The latest of several shootings at popular tourist areas in Mexico. Tonight we speak to a father who was there with his family when the chaos unfolded and Christmas tree arson the tree outside the Fox News building set on fire the suspect taken down on camera Fox anchors outraged top story starts right now And good evening, I'm Tom Yamas. We begin tonight with breaking news. Pfizer says its COVID-19 booster shot provides strong protection against the Omicron variant. The company's data suggesting the third shot is far more effective against the mutation than the original two-dose regimen. Pfizer is the first vaccine maker to release test results against Omicron. And Dr. Fauci says he has no doubt that Moderna and J&J boosters will provide similar results. Pfizer now saying it's also working on a vaccine to specifically target Omicron. However, the Delta variant still running rampant across the country. More than 1,000 Americans dying from the virus every day and ICUs in several states back to full capacity. But potential good news in COVID-19 prevention. Late today, the FDA granting emergency use authorization of AstraZeneca's antibody treatment. Let's get right to NBC's Tom Costello, who's tracking it all for us. The new research from Pfizer is critical as the country tries to arrest the spread of the Omicron variant. Pfizer says its first two vaccine doses do not hold up well against Omicron. But the third shot, the booster, provides 25 times the protection against Omicron. Three doses against Omicron are almost equivalent to the two doses effectiveness we had against the, the wild type, the original variant. So These are very good news. The bottom line, as the virus mutates, the booster may be the shot that keeps you from contracting COVID and staying out of the ER. If you get the booster, you're really in good shape. And so that's very encouraging. News. But as the country enters its third COVID winter, many Americans have grown tired of so many virus, vaccine, and mandate developments. Yet this number is staggering. The CDC reports 787,000 Americans have now died from COVID, more than the number who died in the Civil War, America's deadliest conflict. 1,100 people are dying every day from COVID's Delta variant. Six states now make up half the country's hospitalizations, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Pennsylvania, New York, and Illinois. Most patients unvaccinated, but some are breakthrough cases. Massachusetts is now coping with a third COVID wave. Trauma rooms at UMass Memorial, 120% full. The staff utterly exhausted. What we're hearing about people now is crying on their way into work, knowing what they're about to face. And, and that's what healthcare workers are going through right now. You're tired, but you're not as tired as the healthcare workers that have to deal with this crisis right now. Despite the rising death toll, a new Axios poll finds Americans are eager to put the pandemic behind them. Only a third say they'll stop dining indoors at restaurants. Fewer than a quarter say they're canceling holiday travel plans. Just 28% will skip gathering with friends and families outside their households. For folks who are not vaccinated, you are high risk of ending up in the hospital or the ICU, no matter how young and healthy you are. For the rest of us with those vaccines, we can have an added layer of confidence. 
All right, NBC News correspondent Tom Costello joins us now. Tom, preliminary research showing that Omicron may not be as deadly as Delta. Regardless, though, Pfizer is also yeah. working on a vaccine for the variant. Yeah, they are, and they say that it could be ready in March. However, if the booster does continue to prove that it's enough of a deterrent, that it is effective, along with the vaccines, at preventing Omicron, then Pfizer may not need to go ahead with a vaccine, a dedicated vaccine after all. And by the way, a Pfizer and Merck are working on some antiviral pills you would take at, at first symptoms to prevent you from getting really sick and having to go to the hospital waiting on FDA approval for that medication. Tom? All right, Tom Costello leading us off tonight. Tom, thank you. For more on what Pfizer's latest data could mean in the fight against the Omicron variant, let's bring in Dr. N N Nahid Badalia. She's an NBC News contributor and the director of the Boston University Center for Emerging Infectious Disease Policy and Research. So, doctor, just last week we were telling our viewers about the Omicron variant, about the 30-plus mutations. We just got this great news from Pfizer. Break it down for our viewers. Yeah, Tom, this is very much what we expected. Looking at the mutations on this virus it was telling us that this is a virus that could evade some part of our immune response. And the, the, the good news here is twofold. One is that, yeah, we, we may see, you know, increased breakthrough infections in people who've had prior infections, people who've had maybe two doses, and people need to be aware of that. And that has an implication that I'll talk about in a second. But that with that third booster, you still have very good protection against infection. But here's the important part. Our immune system is rich. It's not. It's beyond just the antibodies, which many of these laboratory tests are, or studies are looking at. There's another part, the T cell part, that gives it this long-term immunity or, or immunity that's going to protect you from severe disease as well. And, and what Pfizer study also said today is that many of that that part of the immune system does not seem to be affected by these these immune responses. So what we're likely to see is that even though there might be more breakthrough infections particularly um, people who have had just two doses of prior infections, you're going to have probably some protection in the two-dose population uh, or very good protection in the two-dose population against severe disease and hospitalizations. However, if I was talking to my family and friends right now, which I am, uh, what I'm recommending to people is to take that third booster because it is going to not just protect you from infections, giving that 25 times you know, increase in antibodies, but it is more likely to also give you an increased protection against severe disease as well. You know, Dr. Fauci came out and said he's confident he'll see similar results for Moderna and J&J &J as well. W with the research just coming out now and the Omicron, you know, only sort of weeks within research in itself here in the U.S., how can Dr. Fauci be so confident that the other vaccines will also be as effective? Well, twofold. One is MR, the, both the mRNA vaccines actually target the same part of the virus, the spike protein, and, and they work in similar ways. So, the, you know, you, you're likely to see the same results in terms of boosters being effective and antibody response being effective in both of those uh, doses. And, and we also know that, you know, because of what Pfizer's data today showed about the T cell part of the immune system and what we generally know about variants so far, Tom, you know, none of them have been able to completely avert our protection against severe disease and hospitalizations after immunizations, that we can predict that about Johnson & Johnson as well. But uh, that caveat that I wanted to tell people is that, you know, if this is a variant that can evade your immune system enough so that you could get an infection, you can transmit it to other people. And why that's important right now is, as you said, we're in the Delta surge, right? We we are potentially going to have a, another surge with Omicron. We need to layer our mitigation measures. And so we need to ensure that we continue to wear those masks and use rapid tests. We, to, to date, as Americans, haven't been able to access or use it as much as other countries have as another layer of how we stop transmission in this country. You know, life in the pandemic is so new for so many of us. It seems like almost every six months we're sort of dealing with a, a new strain or a sort of a new regulation or mandate. So I, I'm curious your reaction to how we reacted both in the news media and the public health world with the Omicron variant, because so many people were so scared of this variant because of all the mutations, because a lot of the reporting, the stock market had a major dip. And yet now we are here just a couple weeks later and we're confident that Pfizer's vaccine, at least, can attack this variant. Do you think the response was right? And is this just something that we have to do to stay ahead of the virus if we can? Yeah, I, I think that you're always going to see some sort of tremor, right? Every time there's new data and there's unknowns. What I thought went well about 
this particular variant is that you, you know, very early had a signal through the nose of people saying, look, we just don't have the data. And, and I, I, what I hope that when people hear that, they take that as let's hold off and we need to collect that data, give scientists the time to collect that data. There, there is news to be considered with this, right? There are potential out outcomes or uh, with this particular variant that are still troublesome. For example, there's a study tonight that shows that mon some of the monoclonal antibodies may actually, their effectiveness may go down against this, this variant as well. So if you are somebody who's, for example, unvaccinated, you're the highest risk for hospitalizations um, and potentially passing away from getting infected from COVID. Now, if you get infected with Omicron, what happens if those monoclonal antibodies don't work? And so we need to work on ensuring that all the tools in our arsenal are working. And, you know, just another heads up for people who are listening, the good news here is that some of those oral antivirals, they work differently. They don't necessarily work on the immune side, you know, and they, they're more of a blunt instrument in terms of stopping the virus and its replication. So it's likely that they will continue to be effective. So at least we have new art tools in our arsenal that may continue to work. Dr. Nahid Badalia, we thank you for your time so much for tonight. We turn now to another major court case, the trial of Ghislaine Maxwell. Intimate photos of Maxwell and convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein taking center stage in court, seized by the FBI from Epstein's New York City mansion hours before Epstein was arrested. Multiple images showing Maxwell giving Epstein a foot massage on a private jet. Stephanie Gosk reports. There are no dates, no locations, but the photos of Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein tell a story of wealth and intimacy, including multiple images of a foot massage on a private jet. The FBI seized these images in a search of Epstein's New York City mansion in 2019, hours after the billionaire financier was arrested on sex trafficking charges. The photos now taking center stage in Maxwell's own sex trafficking trial. Her defense team argues the couple's companionship ended and she became an employee, running Epstein's estates around the world. But testimony from witnesses who knew Maxwell in the early 2000s seemed to challenge that description. The former house manager at Epstein's Palm Beach mansion called Maxwell the lady of the house, and another employee referred to that property as Epstein and Maxwell's home. On the stand Tuesday, an accuser using her first name, Carolyn, testified that Epstein abused her for years during massage sessions that began when she was just 14 years old. She said she went to the Palm Beach estate over 100 times, two to three times a week, Epstein paying her as much as $600 for each visit. Carolyn said Maxwell would sometimes set up the appointments herself. The defense pointed out that Carolyn never mentioned Maxwell when she gave a statement to the FBI in 2007. And while she sued Epstein and another associate, she never sued Maxwell. Stephanie Goss joins us now outside the courthouse. Stephanie, it feels like every single day has been incredibly impactful in this trial. The pace also feels very fast. Prosecution wrapping up. The defense is going to go next. Do we have any idea when the jury may get this case in their hands? Uh, it could be soon, Tom. You know, the prosecution, as you say, has blazed through their case. They had predicted it was going to take four weeks. Instead, it's going to take less than two and might wrap up as soon as tomorrow. We're expecting the fourth accuser to take the stand, and that's basically it. There are a few days off next week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. The court is dark, but then the defense will pick up their case. This jury could have the case before Christmas, Tom. All right, Stephanie Goss for us outside the courthouse tonight. Stephanie, thank you for that. For more on this, we want to bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. He joins Top Story now to break down the developments in this case. So, Danny, I, I covered the Epstein case. There were so many alleged victims in this case. We interviewed a lot of them. But in this trial, we've only heard from a handful. Why is that? because the government likes to win. And by that, I mean that the government is likely cherry picking its witnesses. If you go back to the original prosecution of Jeffrey Epstein back in Florida many years ago, that was an issue back then that uh, law enforcement believed that some of these victims just weren't credible enough for reasons uh, such as past drug abuse, uh, other criminal issues in their past, juvenile records. So make no mistake about it, the government doesn't want to put witnesses on that will be exposed to cross-examination. So I suspect, and we may never know, that there may have been victims who would have liked to have been victims testifying at this trial, and it's possible that the government just didn't think they would make the best case for a conviction. One of the strategies we've seen from the defense is to sort of go back and examine what these women said earlier in their lives, whether it be to the FBI or in civil suits when Maxwell wasn't mentioned. How much does that hurt the prosecution's case? 
It's not popular, but it is a defense attorney's sworn duty to attack the credibility of an accuser in this way. The challenge for the defense in a case like this is that these are very sympathetic witnesses and victims and accusers, and you don't want to be too harsh on them. However, if done properly, then it can cast doubt on the government's case. Uh, after all, they are going back many, many years. So you have all, all the traditional problems with witnesses. You have credibility issues in terms of how long ago this happened. You have memory issues. You have the fact of youth that may, uh, may blur memory. So there are a lot of different avenues for cross-examination here, and the defense needs to explore every single one. So what's your take so far, seeing what's happening? The defense gets a next, the, the next shot here at the case. From the prosecution's take so far, what, what's, what's your stance? Well, government has done exactly what it said it would do. It has brought in all of these different accusers, and some who are not even technically accusers for which he's been charged, to tell a story of essentially Jeffrey Epstein, not so much uh, Maxwell. In fact, they're putting Jeffrey Epstein on trial because they couldn't put him on, on trial. He's no longer with us. Is that and that's smart, be... though? Because it's Maxwell who's, who's on trial now. Expect Maxwell's team to use what is called the empty chair defense, and basically they're going to point to that empty chair and say, the government couldn't get Jeffrey Epstein because guess what? They lost him. He committed suicide. He's no longer here under their watch. So they need, feel they need to punish someone. That's why Maxwell is here. That's the argument they're going to make. And essentially, they're going to argue that the mere fact, even the words in the indictment, that Maxwell may have taken these girls shopping, befriended them, that alone is not grooming. However, uh, only if the government proves that Maxwell is actually involved in what could be considered grooming would this be criminal. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves here, but are you alluding to the possibility that maybe Maxwell beats his case? There's always a chance. Statistically, the odds are against her. The federal government wins well over 90 percent of its cases. 90 percent plus end in either a guilty plea or a conviction. The tiny fraction that go to trial, the odds are even worse, if you can believe that. So if I were playing the odds, which I like to do, I'm risk averse, I would say likelihood of conviction. And, you know, part of that is just the sheer horror of this case. The sheer horror of what Jeffrey Epstein is alleged to have done will spill over into to Maxwell, and I think she is uh, definitely getting uh, being uh, beaten up by that alone, by the specter of Jeffrey Epstein. Danny Savalas for us tonight. Danny, we thank you for that. Turning now to politics, and tonight, Mark Meadows versus the January 6th committee. The former Trump chief of staff now suing members of the committee and Nancy Pelosi as the House panel moves forward with contempt proceedings against him. NBC Justice correspondent Pete Williams joins us now from Washington. So, Pete, what challenges would the Justice Department face in deciding whether to indict Meadows, and could this new civil complaint uh, impact that? Uh, much more challenging than deciding to prosecute Steve Bannon. The Justice Department, for example, has long maintained that it would be unconstitutional to bring contempt of uh, Congress charges against the White House official who claims executive privilege, as Meadows is doing, and yeah. Meadows has cooperated some with the committee. So the prosecutors would have to decide how much different it makes that President Biden has said executive privilege shouldn't count on January 6th issues. And they'd also have to evaluate whether discussions about trying to undo the election results were not official business and therefore can't be covered by executive privilege. As for Meadows' civil lawsuit, he's suing the committee. He's saying it has no legal authority to demand the documents. That is a separate issue. It, you know, he's sort of a preemptive strike against the committee. If the Congress still decides to cite him for contempt, what he claims in his civil lawsuit wouldn't affect the government's calculus on whether to bring charges. So, Pete, is this a fight that anyone at the Justice Department wants to have right now? <laughs> well, whether they want it or not, if Congress cites him for contempt, the Justice Department's going to have to decide whether to bring these charges. One of the complicating things in here is that he's not only a former official, and the Justice Department in the past has said that doesn't matter, they're still covered, but it's the executive privilege claim of the former president that's at issue is here. And we know from previous Supreme Court rulings that while former presidents retain some residual executive privilege, it's diminished, and it can be overborne or at least greatly even further diminished by the current president who says executive privilege shouldn't count. So the Court of Appeals here is going to have to straighten this out in that separate lawsuit that Trump has brought against the archives, and that ruling could come any day, Tom.
Pete Williams for us tonight. Pete, thank you. We stay in Washington now and we move to the growing tension on the border of Ukraine. President Biden speaking for the first time today about his call with Russia's Vladimir Putin. Biden warning his counterpart that his country could face severe economic sanctions if he invaded, but telling reporters today the U.S. would not send troops to defend Ukraine. We have a moral obligation and a legal obligation to our NATO allies. If they were to attack under Article 5, it's a sacred obligation. That obligation does not extend to NATO, I mean to Ukraine, but it would depend upon what the rest of the NATO countries were willing to do as well. But the idea the United States is going to unilaterally use force to confront Russia invading Ukraine is not on the, in the cards right now. All right, NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Kristen Welker joins us now. Kristen, this has gotten a little bit complex, so I want you to walk our viewers through exactly what's happening here. So Ukraine, not a part of NATO. Russia is on the border right there. The president saying that he's not going to send in troops, so essentially showing his hand to Russia. What's going on here? Because a lot of the headlines coming out of Washington are saying that, that Biden didn't accept Putin's red lines. It is complex. You're absolutely right, Tom. And here's the two-pronged point that I think you heard the president make. One, the United States is not going to send troops to Ukraine. However, you heard him talk about the U.S.'s obligation to its NATO allies. That was a significant caveat. Why? Because there are already troops in the region, Tom. And so what President Biden was saying is that if those NATO allies were to feel threatened, were to feel as though they were being attacked, that would change. America's calculation, then America would go into a mode where they were engaging those troops on the ground. And both the president and the president's national security advisor yesterday saying they're leaving the door open to additional deployments, but only if those NATO allies feel threatened. So what is going on behind the scenes right now? Well, I can tell you, based on my conversations here today with a number of sources, Tom, they are preparing sweeping sanctions against Russia if it were to attack Ukraine. Those sanctions would would essentially be uncharted territory. I am told they would target major financial institutions, bond markets, even oligarchs inside Putin's inner circle. Now, they are only going to act on those sanctions again if Russia were to attack as a last resort, essentially. But that is basically the threat that President Biden has put on the table and the White House making the point that those sanctions go much further than the sanctions that were imposed in 2014 when Russia invaded Crimea, the Ukrainian territory. So, Kristen, I, I think the next question has to be, well, what about Ukraine? They are one of our allies. We've provided them with a lot of military aid. The president just went out and said, we're not going to send in troops right away. And they, they're staring down 90,000 Russian troops on the other side of their border. That's right. I think that officials inside Ukraine want to see more action and they want to see a larger response from the administration. What would they like? They want more military equipment as a first step to defend themselves. And, Tom, you have a number of lawmakers on Capitol Hill who are calling for exactly that. They want the administration to send new military equipment now. Now, the administration has said that that's not a step that they're taking at this point. They're in a wait and see mode, effectively, to see what Putin's next move Move is. I can tell you that based on my conversations, the president has asked that he be briefed regularly. They are keeping in close contact with their allies in the region and on Capitol Hill. And they say that is another lesson that they learned from 2014, that that consistent engagement with counterparts overseas and on Capitol Hill is critical. I'm also told they're monitoring social media more aggressively. The mood here inside the White House tonight, I am told, is quite focused as they watch. Watch and wait to see what happens next, Tom. Kristen Welker with a lot of new reporting tonight. Kristen, thank you. We turn out a powerful testimony in the trial of Kim Potter, the former officer caught on camera fatally shooting Dante Wright after she says she mistook her gun for a taser. Wright's mother speaking in court today as the prosecution's first witness, NBC News correspondent Ron Allen is there with more. Shot him Katie Bryant, Dante Wright's mother, seen on police video, arriving at the scene after her son had been shot and killed by a police officer during a traffic stop last April. And I wanted to protect him because that's what mothers do. Bryant, the first witness at the trial of former officer Kimberly Potter, charged with manslaughter. She has pleaded not guilty. Potter's attorneys say she fired her gun, mistaking it for a taser. 
Are you Jurors okay? seeing new police video of her reaction. This was an accident. She's a human being. Prosecutors insist Potter, who had 25 years of experience, was reckless and flouted her training, showing the jury images of the two weapons, highlighting the differences. She drew it, she aimed it, she pointed it directly at Dante Wright. And she did those things without bothering to confirm what was in her hand. While prosecutors portray Wright as a young father driving to a car wash, stopped because of an air freshener, illegal in this state, the defense telling the jury Wright had no driver's license, an outstanding arrest warrant, a case involving a weapon, and that Wright tried to flee in his car when the officers tried to take him into custody. All he has to do is stop and he'd be with us, but he goes. She can't let him leave because he's going to kill her partner. And so she does taser, 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 and she pulls the trigger, believing that it was a taser. All right, Ron Allen joins us now live. Ron, how long do we expect this case could take? Could, could this actually go into Christmas? The judge has said that she hopes to be finished before Christmas. The prosecution continues tomorrow. We expect to hear from the passenger, a young woman who was in the car with Dante Wright. Uh, we also expect to hear from more police officers. But the prosecution is zeroing in on this argument that Kim Potter was a very experienced officer, more than 20 years on the force. In fact, she was training another officer that day, and she should have known the difference between a, ta a taser and the gun. They say she flouted her training. They described her as escalating that situation, as interfering in that traffic stop that was happening and really being the cause of the problem. While, of course, on the other side, the defense is pushing back and today raising the specter that Wright, by getting back in his car, apparently trying to drive off in the car, was actually putting the officers' lives at, at risk. Uh, and one of the, in the opening statements, the defense attorney said that part of felt like uh, one of her partners could have been killed. Very dramatic uh, testimony, very dramatic statements about uh, from each side about what happened that day. Uh, but again, the bottom line is this should take about two weeks, and we'll see if she's convicted of manslaughter, which carries up to 15 years in prison if she's convicted. All right, Tom? Ron Allen for us tonight. Ron, we thank you for that. Now to Chicago in the roller coaster trial of former Empire actor Jesse Smollett, who's accused of staging a hate crime attack against himself. The case now going to the jury after both sides presented their closing arguments today. NBC's Megan Fitzgerald breaks down what jurors are now weighing. Tonight, the fate of former Empire star Jesse Smollett now in the hands of a jury. The seven day trial ending with closing arguments. The prosecution arguing Smollett planned and orchestrated a hate crime hoax with two brothers, paying them $3,500, then lying to police about the whole thing. The defense closing by once again going after the brothers' credibility and calling them liars, saying Smollett only paid one of the brothers for fitness coaching. The former Empire star facing six felony counts of disorderly conduct. Smollett told police that two masked men attacked him around 2 a.m. in January of 2019 in downtown Chicago, yelling racist and homophobic slurs and putting a noose around his neck. At first, the story spread as a hate crime against a gay black man, despite some skepticism over the details. If I had said it was a Muslim or a Mexican or someone black, I feel like the doubters would have supported me a lot much more, a lot more. And that says a lot about the place that we are in our country right now. But then the Chicago police announcing they believe Smollett faked the attack, calling it a, quote, bogus police report. Why would anyone, especially an African-American man, use the symbolism of a noose to make false accusations? The actor has always maintained his innocence. I've been truthful and consistent on every single level since day one. I would not be my mother's son if I was capable of one drop of what I have been accused of. Smollett says one brother was an acquaintance, the other was a friend who he had a sexual relationship with. His family appearing in court every day of the trial. I believe that a lot of the facts have actually come to the surface. Now it's up to a jury to decide which argument they'll believe. All right, Megan Fitzgerald joins us now from Chicago. Megan, have we heard anything from the jury just yet? Well, Tom, we know just before jurors left for the day, they asked the judge for an exhibit. Um, now, according to the Tribune, this was a calendar that was presented by the prosecution marking important days leading up to this attack, Tom. 
All right, Megan Fitzgerald for us. Megan, thank you. That is some news close to home. The Fox News Christmas tree just across the street from us here at 30 Rock was set on fire. The suspect immediately taken down by police, and tonight the network is expressing outrage. Overnight, cameras capturing nearly every moment of a Christmas crime that lit up Midtown Manhattan. The Fox News Christmas tree set ablaze outside the company's headquarters. Primetime host Shannon Bream showing viewers live. It appears that our giant Christmas tree there just a couple of minutes ago was completely engulfed in flames. Tourists and workers in the area shooting cell phone videos as the 50-foot structure known as the All-American Christmas tree turned into an inferno. Many of the 10 thousand glass ornaments and 100,000 lights that make up the decor melting, sending plumes of black smoke into the sky. Police quickly taking down the alleged arsonist. Fox describing the man as, quote, tinsel torching suspect Craig Tamanaha, 49 years old. The motive, I, I don't think, is clear at this point. Um, it, it's an individual that's known to us. He has a a series of low-level arrests, some drug arrests. He, he was issued some earlier this year, some appearance tickets and didn't come back to court, which unfortunately is something we see all too often. He also has some low-level arrests in uh, out of state. Investigators say he climbed the metal superstructure, lit papers he brought with him on fire and shoved the papers into the tree. It's beginning to look a lot like arson. Fox News morning anchors waking up to the charred display outside their offices. Who sets a Christmas tree on fire? It's a, it's a and, tree that unites us that brings us together. It's about the Christmas spirit. It is about the holiday season. Uh, it's it, about Jesus. It's about Hanukkah. It is about everything that we stand for as a country, freedom and being able to, to worship the way that you want to worship. It makes me so mad. Estimates are that the damage is somewhere in the ballpark of half a million dollars. All right, also tonight on Top Story, a car plunging into Niagara Falls, a heroic rescue attempted and all of it caught on camera. Here's Issa Gutierrez with more. Tonight, dramatic video of a car stuck in the water just 50 yards from the brink of Niagara Falls. You're watching the Coast Guard fly above the vehicle and one rescuer descending into waves to retrieve whoever's inside. We've never had a vehicle in the, in the water this close to the brink. Officials responding to a call from eyewitnesses who said they saw the car floating down the river before it got stuck here. We saw a lot of tourists here taking pictures trying to document what was going on. Jeff Preval is a reporter at our local affiliate in Buffalo, WGRZ. He filmed these videos on his phone. The rip currents are extremely fast. They're crashing. They're very aggressive. The weather, it's lightly snowing here. It's cold as well. What was the biggest question in your mind when you got there and you saw what was going on? The question that we had that a lot of people had right there at the scene was how this driver, how this car was able to get into the water. Preval stood there watching as the Coast Guard prepared for their rescue for two hours. In the meantime, rescuers used a drone to see how many people were inside the car. Despite the incredible attempt, it was too late. Officials saying the driver was deceased a woman in her 60s and from the area. A lot of people were out there and were troubled by what they saw. In his 14 years of reporting, Preval says he's never seen anything quite like this. Yeah, this was different. This is difficult. This is something that I'm probably going to have to, you know, talk to my mom and, you know, loved ones and friends about uh, just to sort of decompress. Isa Gutierrez, NBC News. All right, Isa, we thank her for that. Still ahead tonight, the jet ski attack. Armed gunmen pulling up to a beach in Cancun and opening fire. Tonight, what one father told us about the moment shots rang out while his children were nearby. Plus, the police officer racing towards a burning car and met with an explosion, how he managed to get the trapped driver to safety. And Tiger Woods returns. The announcement from the golf legend as he prepares to compete for the first time since that horrific crash. Stay with us. Top Story is just getting started. Back now with a terrifying scene in Cancun. Gunmen pulling up to a beach on jet skis, firing into the air. Beachgoers, including tourists and families, fleeing the scene. It's part of a growing number of violent gang-related scenes playing out at one of Mexico's most popular destinations. NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard has more. Tonight, security on high alert at a popular beach in Cancun, Mexico, after police say a group of armed men on jet skis pulled up to the shore of a popular resort and began firing shots into the air. 
The resort was just chaos, yelling, kids crying, obviously. How many shots did you hear? At least 20. My wife and kids were at the pool downstairs, which is maybe 100 yards from the beach. I woke up to gunfire. Zane Jones was one of the Americans on the beach with his family when the gunmen opened fire. He says his family has not returned to the beach and are contemplating leaving Mexico. My wife, definitely afraid after this. Kids definitely still shaking up. They just saw the jet skis. They saw the guns. The Secretary of Public Security for the area confirming that no injuries or deaths were reported, but it's part of a string of concerning events. In recent days, we have seen some really worrisome events having to do with organized crime affecting tourists in Mexico, especially in beach resorts. This incident coming on the heels of a deadly shootout in November near several luxury hotels in Cancun when a group of nearly 15 gunmen executed two drug dealers from a rival gang. Tourists and hotel workers ducking for cover wherever they could, some scrambling for safety in the hotel lobby. More and more incidents making many tourists think twice before booking their vacation. Definitely a pretty strong force out here since. It's not the best way to enjoy the beach. But for those who are regulars, it's not enough to keep them away from Mexico's sunny skies. I'm not overly concerned by it because this is the first time ever We've been in Cancun for 31 years, you know, coming down for 31 years. We've never had any issues. The state of Quintana Roo, which is home to Mexican Caribbean resort towns like Cancun and Tulum, has seen an increase in violent shootouts over the last few years as rival cartels fight for control of the area. Just two months ago, two women were killed. Tourists caught in the crossfire. As a shooting broke out between two rival groups outside a restaurant in Tulum. And in June, two men on a beach in the area were shot to death and an American tourist injured. The U.S. has not restricted travel to Quintana Roo, but advises Americans to exercise increased caution due to the criminal activity and violence in the state. The U.S. State Department has already urged Americans to, quote, reconsider travel to Mexico, designating it just below its level four do not travel advisory. It doesn't mean that people shouldn't visit at all. It just means that they should be careful when they do so. Just don't take your safety for granted. Keep your eyes open. All right, Von Hilliard joins us now live on set. So, Von, two questions. First, this is such a serious issue for Mexico. The National Guard is now patrolling the beach, you were telling me. And also that tourist you interviewed, the family affected, they actually had some good advice for people traveling over there, right? Exactly. One, when you're going overseas, particularly in this area here, is put the phone number of the local embassy or the consulate in. And so in case you need to get out of the country or you need help, you know and have somebody to contact. But you just saw that video there yourself. The National Guard already had an increased presence here in these latest months here. But then after this, the, that one father there, Zane, outlining to us the fact that they're still out there. They had yellow tape around the beach. He said they have a week left in their trip, but he has four and 12-year-old sons. He said that they're looking to cut it short. In years past, it seemed like Cancun was sort of a buffer zone away from that narco crime traffic. It seems like things may be changing, though. All right, Vaughn, we thank you for all of that. When we come back, Scott Peterson resentenced the man who was on death row for the high-profile murder of his pregnant wife, Lacey, back in court. The new sentence just handed down, and the emotional moment, Lacey's mother faced her daughter's killer. And the shooting at a mall filled with holiday shoppers, the new images from police as they hunt for the gunman. All right, now to Top Stories news feed, and we begin with the New York City police officer saving a driver from a burning car. Check this video out. New body cam footage shows the officer trying to extinguish the flames. When that doesn't work, he goes towards the car as an explosion erupts. The officer eventually able to pull the driver to safety. He was hospitalized, but is expected to survive. The officer did suffer minor injuries. All right, and the search tonight is on for a suspect who opened fire inside a busy mall in Texas. New surveillance images, you see it right here, show the armed man walking into the mall near Fort Hood. Police say he shot one person several times before fleeing the shooting, sending holiday shoppers running for cover. They were forced to shelter in place for several hours while officers looked for the gunman. The victim is expected to survive. Kellogg says it will permanently replace 
1,400 workers who have been on strike since October. The decision comes after the workers rejected a five-year contract offer that would have provided 3% raises. Their union says the amount was too low because they routinely work more than 80 hours a week and kept plants running through the pandemic. All right, Tiger Woods is returning to competition 10 months after seriously injuring his leg in a car crash. The golf legend announced today he will play in the PNC Championship with his 12-year-old son, Charlie. The 36-hole event begins December 18th. Last week, Woods revealed that he almost lost his leg in that February rollover crash and that it's unlikely he'll return to competitive golf full-time. Next to a grim milestone as we close out 2021, at least seven major cities have already broken their annual homicide record with three weeks left in the year. Philadelphia seen more than 500 killings. Gabe Gutierrez is there tonight with the story. For many cities, big and small, this has been the deadliest year ever. In Philadelphia alone, more than 520 homicides, breaking a record that had stood for over 30 years. And for Desiree Goodson, too many agonizing moments to count. What will you miss most about him? Oh, Samira always smiles. Samira, he makes me happy, like he cheers me up. She still speaks about her 14-year-old son, Samir Jefferson, as if he's still here. But as a high school freshman waited for a bus last week, he was killed. Police say two people got out of a car, chased him across the street, then fired about 35 shots. These are some of the bullet holes still on the side of this pharmacy. Samir was hit 18 times. The people that kill Samir ain't killers, they monsters. Like, they shot my son 18 times. Among the other cities already setting records for murders this year, Portland, Tucson, Toledo, St. Paul, Austin, and Albuquerque. The debate over why is raging. Some experts blame the pandemic in part. Bail reform keeping more criminals out of jail, more guns, and fewer officers. Indianapolis also hitting an all-time homicide high. We are definitely recruiting, and I want to put those officers on the streets. Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner argues that while homicides are up in his city, other crimes such as rape and robberies that don't involve a gun are down. We don't have a crisis of lawlessness. We don't have a crisis of crime. We don't have a crisis of violence. But former Mayor Michael Nutter is slamming those comments as white privilege, saying the progressive DA has not been tough enough on criminals and demanding Krasner apologize to victims' families, like Desiree Goodson. My son's not coming back. I don't care about no justice. None of that brings him here back. None of it. Police here have arrested two suspects in connection with her son's murder. And tonight, two more are still on the run. Experts around the country are having a tough time pinpointing exactly why murder rates are soaring or whether this trend might continue into next year, Tom. All right, Gabe Gutierrez in Philly tonight for us. Gabe, we thank you for that. Now to an emotional day in court in California. Convicted murderer Scott Peterson resentenced to life in prison today for killing his wife Lacey when she was eight months pregnant with their son. The ruling coming after Peterson's death sentence was overturned last year. Lacey's mother in the courtroom today with scathing words for the man who murdered her daughter. Erin McLaughlin has more. After nearly 20 years on death row, Scott Peterson back in court, resentenced to life without parole for the murder of his wife Lacey and unborn son Connor. Peterson shackled to his seat and wearing a mask showed little emotion in court, the judge declining his request to speak. Lacey's mother, Sharon Rocha, addressing Peterson directly. I've seen no sorrow and no remorse from you at all. I still feel the grief every day after 19 years. Peterson was moved off death row following a California Supreme Court decision overturning his death sentence, citing a series of clear and significant errors in jury selection. In 2004, Peterson was found guilty of murdering 27-year-old Lacey, then eight months pregnant with their son Connor, on Christmas Eve. Their remains washed ashore months later, just miles from where Peterson said he'd been fishing the day of her disappearance. Peterson's legal team now pushing for a retrial. With that pending tonight, Rocha's chilling words to the man convicted of killing her daughter. No matter what happens, no matter what transpires in the future, there are two things that will never change. Lacey and Connor will always be dead, and you will always be their murderer. All right, Aaron McLaughlin joins us now from outside the courthouse in Redwood City, California. Aaron Peterson resentenced to life in prison, as you reported there, but his legal team still fighting this. What's their next move? 
Well, his legal team is pushing for a full retrial, Tom, alleging juror misconduct. Now, an evidentiary hearing is scheduled for the end of February, and a judge's ruling on that scheduled for within 90 days of that February court date. Tom. All right, Aaron McLaughlin live for us tonight on Top Story. Aaron, we thank you for that. Now to Top Story's Global Watch. Brazilian soccer legend Pele has been hospitalized again. The 81-year-old undergoing chemotherapy treatment for a colon tumor. He is in stable condition and is expected to be released in the next few days. The soccer star underwent surgery to remove the tumor back in September and spent several weeks in the hospital. And Germany has a new chancellor. 63-year-old Olaf Scholz sworn in today. He will replace Angela Merkel, who served a historic 16 years as Germany's leader. Scholz, who is the leader of the Social Democratic Party, won a secret vote in Parliament after the party's narrow victory in September elections. All right, the U.K., Canada, and Australia are joining the U.S. in a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Olympics. The countries have all announced they will not send government representatives to the Winter Games over China's alleged human rights abuses. It does not affect their athletes' ability to compete. China has vowed to react with, quote, firm countermeasures. Coming up, Instagram in the hot seat. The social media giant grilled by lawmakers over the app's potential harm to young people. The changes Instagram now claims they're making. That's coming up. We're back now with a major hearing on Capitol Hill. The CEO of Instagram grilled by senators today over the company's impact on young users. NBC News senior national correspondent Kate Snow has the details. I firmly believe that Instagram and that the Internet more broadly can be a positive force in young people's lives. It was Instagram head Adam Mosseri's first appearance in Congress, with senators expressing frustration over reports that the social media platform knows it can be harmful to teen users. Nothing changes. Nothing. Self-policing depends on trust. The trust is gone. I do strongly support federal regulation, not industry regulation, when it comes to youth safety. Ahead of the hearing, Instagram announced new tools aimed at teen safety, including nudging them toward different topics if they've been dwelling on something for a long time, encouraging them to take breaks. And starting in March, parents will be able to view how much time their teens spend on Instagram and set limits. Today, Mosseri said he won't stop development on a kid's version of Instagram. I believe as a parent, it's going to be more responsible to develop an age-appropriate version of Instagram for those under 13. Senator Mike Lee said his staff created a fictitious account for a 13-year-old girl. As soon as she followed the top celebrity recommended by Instagram, he said inappropriate content was suggested. It was hairstyling videos and innocuous stuff one minute. The next minute, after we followed a, a famous female celebrity, it changed and it went dark fast. If we recommended something that we shouldn't have, I, I'm accountable for that. Starting next year, Mazzari said Instagram will allow users to see a chronological version of their feed instead of one created by algorithms. A significant step, but lawmakers are demanding more. Kate Snow, NBC News. All right, when we come back from meme to champion, the kid behind this viral photo, now a high school football star, what he said about growing up on the Internet and in the spotlight and how it shaped him. Finally tonight, the tough lessons of going viral, how one kid became an Internet sensation, but now is making headlines on his own terms. You might recognize Dennis Collin from this viral video. Say, ooh. Say, ooh. It was back in 2013 when he was nine years old. The images of him standing in line at a Popeye's giving a side-eye glare became an Internet sensation and was forever immortalized as a meme. But for him, viral fame was not exactly easy. When it first came out, I felt real sad about it, started crying about it. Since the video was released in 2013, Colin had a hard time separating himself from his internet fame. I couldn't do anything because I was this small guy in middle school. And they never got like the chance to like know me as a person, like know Dennis. So most of it was really uncool. But eight years later, Colin has come into his own, a standout on his New Jersey high school football team. Fourth and goal from the one-yard line for Clifton. Over the weekend, the East Orange Jaguars capped off their undefeated season by winning the state championship in a thrilling triple overtime stunner. This would win the game into the end zone. Oh, what a play. Colin's team winning the title with a final score of 30-24. to 24.
do my helmet, start crying. Because <laughs> I work real hard for this since freshman year. Colin once again going viral, but this time for all the right reasons and adding a nod to his nine-year-old self. Thanks so much for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. I'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.